to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. If you've never listened to my podcast before, then welcome to you. And please hit that subscribe button. It's hugely beneficial to us podcasters. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. But if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season has been focused on interviewing other people who did or planned to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. That's what keeps the show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal or leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description, of course, as well as the links to the guest. As of always, a portion of the proceeds from this podcast do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Hey, folks. Hey, folks, welcome back to the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. You might notice that this is the first ever video podcast that I am putting on. So I'm excited to have my uh, guest be somebody who's actually returning. So he's been very patient with me as I try to figure all this stuff out. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Pike uh, has written an incredible book. book. He's got an amazing story. Uh, he is a soldier against all odds. Welcome to the show, Jason Pike. Hey, Amanda, again, thank you again for being on your show. I'm very honored to be here. Yeah. I, I just I just think it's so awesome that I get to have you for the patriotic holidays. So uh, you just reminded me that the last one was on Veterans Day. This one is airing on Memorial Day. And between these, these events, I'm sure that there's going to be some changes that are happening in your life. You did say before we started recording that your daughter just graduated. So congratulations on having her back home and having her with her, uh, you said an engineering degree, smart girl. Yeah. Some mechanical engineering. Um, apparently my bad genetics did not pass on to her in that way. Uh, I, I was learning disabled and yet we know about that. And, uh, I screwed up a lot and, uh, but no, she's doing pretty good. Uh, much, much, much better than I did, put it that way. <laughs> Well, I think she may have learned from your mistakes, but I think you also did. And she probably noticed a lot of that when she was growing up. Oh, yeah. I told her everything from the very beginning. I failed first grade when I was seven years old, like, you know, when, when you were so. And so she's like, yeah, you failed first grade. I said, no. So I told her everything. Yeah, I was I was very honest with her. I love that. I love that. There's too many parents these days that want to sugarcoat everything and make their kids think that they are perfect. And that's like the worst thing that you could do with parenting because no kid can ever live up to that. I cannot. There's no way. I mean, one thing I learned about my memoir is that every, I mean, we, we know everyone's not perfect. We, we, they say that. But it, when I come down to writing this memoir, I learned that really nobody, I mean, we're very imperfect, <laughs> very, but we don't, we, we all you do is you see the A game out there on social media. You don't see the other side. You know, the dirty laundry, we're not trained to put out dirty laundry. So that's just the way it goes. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, you know, I, I want to bring up the fact that this episode is airing specifically on Memorial Day because you being a, a service member, thank you for your service. Uh, I know Memorial Day has more of an impact for our men and women in the armed services. Um, and it means something a little bit different. I want to remind people that it's not all about the barbecues and hanging out and throwing a football around in a yard. What does Memorial Day mean to you, Jason Pike? I just go back to my war. Though. When I go back to the war in Afghanistan and where I did see a lot of bombs and blood and guts, that's where it hits me a little bit. And in many ways, I'm kind of glad when Memorial Day is over. So I don't have to think about that because Memorial Day, Memorial Day, wave the flag and all this stuff. But it, Memorial Day is about the people who died that were over there. And that's not a good thing to go to. Um, I saw a Humvee got blown to parts and everything was, it was an uh, improvised explosive devices and it just blew everything away. And to me, you know, I, I don't know who those people were that were driving in that car that were only, you know, not far from me. I, they were just right outside the gate. And it was, we knew. But see, that's Memorial as well. I don't know. Who, but when I was in Afghanistan, I did not want to go to see the funerals. I did not want to go see caskets or dead bodies. My job was to get the hell out of there. I want to get the hell out of there. And so Memorial Day is about people who have died. 
and that's not a, you know, and so that's kind of what it means to me. And so, uh, and they say, thank you for your service. And that's cool, you know, but that's it, just going back to some memories. And I think veterans, like on these veterans days and these Memorial days, we have sort of a hard time sometimes if you've, if you've been over there and done it. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And it's not about the mattress sales and the, the you know, used <laughs> car lots having these special <laughs> sales. It really is a, a darker history behind Memorial Day. And it's, it is a time of reflection and quiet solitude. And I feel like there's so often that we forget that and it gets so disrespected because it's become something else entirely now. Yeah, it's barbecues and hanging out and it's a day off. I guess it's a federal holiday and things of that nature. And, you know, as we go more and more people uh, are don't, are not familiar with the military service. They're not familiar with a person in their uniform. So a lot of people just don't know. And they just think it's a moment all day. They don't even really understand what it is, I think. Yeah. Right. Right. And it gets so confused. I mean, between Memorial Day and Veterans Day and Labor Day, everybody gets all of these messages completely confused. They have no idea which one stands for what. And one of the things that I, I like to try to encourage people to do is here in Denver at Fort Logan Cemetery, they have a military service for Memorial Day. It's not about the car shows or the footballs or the the family get togethers and eating corn on the cob and trying to figure out who can wolf down an ice cream sundae the fastest. It really is about spending the time in the cemetery with those that we have lost. Yeah. And yeah. I, I definitely I want to acknowledge that on our episode. Um, my father was military. My grandfather was. My brother was. My husband was in the Navy. I mean, I come from this long line of understanding what the military is, but it took me leaving home and going out into the world to really understand what Memorial Day is. I think a lot of people need to understand that. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, yeah, my one of my favorite favorite. It's not Independence Day. It's going to be Independence. I like July the Fourth because that's when we got our independence, and I love my independence, and I understand <laughs> what a free country is and what a not a free. So that's. That's kind of my, that's more of a pot, to me, that's positive. Memorial Day is, <clears throat> that's about the death and things, bad things. But then Independence Day is like freedom, yay, fireworks. I like that. Veterans Day is just for just all the veterans. And so that's for everyone, everyone who served. And so, uh, yeah, but I like Independence Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one's always fun. I still try to hide in the basement away from the fireworks just so <laughs> I can keep the cats nice and calm. Uh, but Fourth of July in general is just such a fun holiday. So, yeah. Jason, I know last time we talked um, at the end of our conversation, after we had got done recording, we got into... Um, Let's see, I'm already going to mark this one as explicit. We got into the shit. And by that, I mean, <laughs> you were telling me about a time that you were literally in the shit. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, was, yeah, that's a big story. Yeah, yeah that's a big story. Um, you know, a lot of people in their lives go through shit. I mean, we go through our ups and downs and they say, I'm neck deep in shit. That, that's a term. I am in shit. I am up the creek. These are terms people use, and really, for me, I've literally almost drowned in shit, and I'll have to, I'm going to put the story together about how this happened, and now a lot of people, neck deep, I'm talking about suffocating in the shit, and I, I so uh, on my website, jasonpike.org, you're going to find, I've literally been neck deep in shit and almost died, and so, no, so I was in South Korea uh, as a young man. And hard charging young lieutenant, um, probably my age was about 27, 27 years old. Um, we're competing. What we're doing is we're out there at night, land navigation. Land navigation is finding your way along with a map and a compass. Uh, you do it in the daytime, you do it at nighttime. It's a soldier skill and we need to find our way through the woods. We walk through the woods, we walk through everything, and we have to find our way with a military map and a compass to find your way. And I, I was out there walking at night, along with, they dropped us off about nine or 10 o'clock at night, uh, up along the DMZ, the Demilitarized Military Zone of North Korea and South Korea. It was at Warrior Base. It was in the summertime. And um, so 
I was walking along a rice paddy looking for a point along with other people, but they had, we were all separated out on a lawn. So I was alone at night. Um, I could smell it. There was some sort of a cesspool to my left and I knew that it was there. And so what I did is I purposely tried to stay away from it. I knew that I didn't want to go into the cesspool, but you know, shit slippery. And I slipped, I went down an embankment at night alone. I went into neck deep. I was there. I was here. I am. Um, my, you know, I, I'm going to drown in this shit. And I felt uh, that I was, I, uh, I was trying to stay above the, the shit with just my nose and my mouth. I didn't want to go under. Um, at the time I was like, Oh my God, I've never had a, you know, I've never had a family. I've never had a wife or a daughter or whatever. I was like, you know, I can't die like this shit. It's like, my last name is Pike. I'm, I'm going to be called Poop and Pike. I'm on Pike dies and poop on the DMZ, South Korea. That's the headlines. And I'm thinking, I'm going down. And I felt that there was a <clears throat> the gag influence uh, because <clears throat> of the smell. And that it was just horrifying to just be in the shit. So I'm in a like a ditch along a rice paddy with my head stuck out. Now, my military equipment, I had a backpack on. I have a rifle. Uh, well, that was strapped on me, and I have, and so I was going down in this shit, um, and I didn't know what to do, and I finally just decided to do a, uh, it was like a quit sand, so I decided to slowly do a angle, um, like a, a caterpillar, and I, I angled up out of it, and I got on the top of it, and I low crawled out. Once I low crawled out of the shit, um, I got onto the rice patty, uh, onto the rice stubble, I was a mob of shit at this time, and I just, you know, I was, uh, wow, you know, I just laid on my back as a mob of shit and looked up at the stars, and I'm thinking, God, like, why, why do you put me in this shit like this? I mean, it's all you one damn thing after the next. So I was like, whoa, you know, this is really bad. I don't even know what to do. And uh, so then I started, well, what does a dog do? And that's why I started rolling around like a dog uh, to get the bulk of it off. Then it was perfect. It was stuck into the uniform and everything else. So now I faced another issue, another problem that I had. And the next problem was I got to save my face. Uh, you know, I'm a lieutenant. I'm a young man. And I'm going to be known as the pipe, the pooping pipe. And I says, you know, I need to avoid any type of harassment and all this ragging and things that soldiers do that are normal. So I thought, well, I, I, I got to find a way out of here and not every, no, no one, I don't, I don't want anybody to know about it. So we're not supposed to talk to the Korean people. Well, I kind of break rules a little bit, but uh, so, uh, so I saw uh, a light out there. It was a farmer's house and I started walking toward the light. Uh, I don't know what even, I don't even, I don't know Korean language. And I don't even know what I was going to do, but I was going to find help outside of the American uh, people. And, uh, and to, so I didn't want them to know about it. And so I walked toward this light. I didn't know if I was walking toward heaven or hell again, but I just walked toward the light and I went up to the front porch and I knocked on the door. I knew a little bit of Korean. I go, Anya Haseo, Anya Haseo. That means hello, not, not hello. And then the woman came to the house, uh, to the front door on the porch, and she goes, she looks at me and she goes, I go, I go. That means ooh, ooh. And then, uh, but we were mostly doing hand signals and things. And uh, so she motioned me. She knew, I mean, English was not necessary. She could see I was a mob of shit. So, so, uh, so she, she motioned me to strip naked, and I stripped naked in front of a complete stranger, a uh, woman. I was in my 20s, she was in her 40s. And I gave her all my stuff and she motioned, it was hand language, that she was going to find me that next morning and clean it up and give it to me that next morning. So I was butt naked, except I kept my rifle and my map and my compass so I could get back. And uh, I walked back barefoot naked from her house about a mile or so through the woods. Um, and uh, so and then I was facing another problem was I'm going to find my way back before everyone else comes back. But I got to make sure that no one sees me naked walking through the woods or make sure they don't smell me. So if I see them, I got to move away. So I kind of went, went back to the camp naked and I, I was still smelling, uh, even though I was naked. And so I had to wash up and I wanted to move all my stuff outside. 
so she could find me. So I, I put my, from the tent, I put, put my, I slept under the stars that night. Uh, my fairy godmother, Ajima, the woman of the house, she saw me. She came and found me, just like she said, that next morning at 5.30 in the morning. And she gave me a clean equipment. Everything was all cleaned up. And uh, so I was like, wow, this is great. I saved my face that night. And I got out of shit that night. Eh, I failed the course. But, you know, two things. Uh, two out of three ain't bad. And so I did those two things. It took me a few more of the times to get this competition badge of land navigation. But yeah, that's the story of Pike almost dying and poop, Pike and poop, poop and Pike. And, uh, but no, I can tell that now. And it's a good story to, to, to talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that is wild. And honestly, truth is stranger than fiction. It's just bizarre. <laughs> the kind it of is. things that you have found yourself. And we talked about a few of them last time. I know you've got a ton of stories. Have you got another one that you can share? Okay, how about being electrocuted naked and, <laughs> and being sexually humiliated? This is one no. I, I don't I don't know why that nobody's asking me about that one. It's in my book. All these crazy stories are in my book. Well, I'm um, gonna ask you about this one. You gotta share now. <laughs> okay, cool. I had no problem. So um, well, I was in the special operators. I was in the special forces as a support guy. Special forces are the green berets, they jump out of airplanes and do wild and crazy things. Some people call them the snake eaters. I was in the snake eaters for a short while, but I was not a true snake eater. I, I, I got, I got, I was, I was a support of the snake eaters, but I jumped with them. I lived with them. So we, uh, so there's this airborne like a fraternity we have among officers that are in special forces at the time. There's only men there, and uh, and uh, so it was a called a propped blast. So when you jump out of an airplane, you, there's a prod. I, I want to get too complicated, but it was a club for airborne paratroopers. And um, the officers ran the, ran this little club and you had to get initiated. It's the normal harassment, this and that, physical fitness and jumping out of airplanes and things of that nature. That nature. So, but at graduation time, which is only four days, just, you know, you have to put up with a bunch of crap. And then you go to graduate to be in this little airborne club, right, among men and officers in the special forces. And uh, so, well, uh, <laughs> I was a lieutenant. And so, uh, so, the, the, <laughs> so what happens was you have to say this saying, it's like, I am the best airborne soldier, blah, 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 blah. There's a, like a paragraph you had to memorize beforehand. Uh, but, and you have to tell them that you're a great trooper and you'll do everything they tell you to do, whatever. So, but... And you have to stand in the doorway before it was a mock airplane door. Uh, we were in a barracks and the sides of the airplane were electric. There was electrocution. You had to keep your hands on the door while you're being electrocuted. You had to say the uh, saying of the airborne soldier. Now, once everybody had to do it and then you jump down onto a little step and then you answer some questions and then you're in the club. This is the graduation. This is the, you prove that you're a good soldier or whatever, airborne soldier. And um, they wanted me to stand on the side of the air and say, Pike, you're going to come down here naked. I said, what? No, you're going to do it naked. No, you're, oh, God. So um, I'm going to be naked in front of all these people being electrocuted. Now, I don't know why they pick on me to be like, no, nah, I've got a learning problem. Maybe I'm autistic. I don't know what it is. So I said, okay, well, I, hell, I'll do anything. Uh, and so... I, 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 dread, I, I stripped down naked. This is the second time in the book I talk about being nude. <laughs> so I get, I, get in the, uh, I get in the doorway naked and I'm being electrocuted and I, I did my airborne saying and then I jumped down in front of the committee of people. We all jumped down to answer additional questions from the committee and I'm sitting there naked and they said, Frank, why is your penis so small? Sir, sir, I don't know. That's, I mean, the, the size of the ship, the motion of the ocean. I said, sir, it's not, the, it's not the size of the ship. It's the motion of the ocean. And they said, all right, you're in. And I was like, oh, wow. Oh, and then they had this big old grog of alcohol, mixture of alcohol, and we all had to drink it and we all got drunk. But, you know, it's like, you know, being the same, at the time, my feeling was, I'm very happy. I, uh, you know, a lot of people would think, dude, you done sexually humiliated me and all that stuff about my penis and stuff. And uh, well, at the time, you know, 
yeah. When you're on stress, things have a tendency to get small. Like, that's just the way. But I, I, that took me a while to learn in, 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 in this book. But uh, no, uh, but really, um, I was re my feeling at the time was not sexual humiliation. I was like, I was happy to be in this group. They were a good group of people to me. I felt. Did they did they take did they take things overboard at that particular time? I think they did. But I was in a special operating group, and I these were the best of the best. They got out of line, and well, those things happen, and uh, I have no hard feelings for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I, I love that you were able to just like forgive them, just kind of as a blanket statement. You know what? Whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, that... there's, yeah, there's some there, there's some there's situations in this book we talked about on the last show that I, it's very difficult for me to forgive, like right. false accusations and things. But this one was just. Uh, I, I, I it was okay with that, yeah. So I'm okay with that. It's Fun just, hazing with the guys, right? Yeah, yeah. And really, the night they were really, for the most part, I don't think a lot of them. I, I think a lot of them thought this is really going too far. It was the commander who wanted me down there naked, and he was a full colonel. He actually made a general, but uh, it's like I think a lot of people were probably looking at him like, eh, you know, he's kind of going overboard with this stuff. But I did it. I made it through, and. Uh, Got electrocuted naked, made fun of us, uh, sexually humiliated, but really I had no problem with that. Uh, I was just happy to be in the group and uh, so forth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How many times did you jump? Oh, about 14, 15 times. I did. Uh, so you do five jump at it, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. You go jump out of airplanes and that's five jumps to get you qualified and you get your airborne patch. And then I went into a special operations group and I did about another 10 more with the special operators. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. That's yeah, fun. It was. it was a fun, fun, fun time. I have an absolute terrifying fear of moving heights. I don't know if I'd ever be able to do it, but I want to do it just to see if I can use that as a tool to get over my fear. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, luckily, like when I was a young man, our, I, I, you, we just climbed trees and we jumped and we were lived out in the woods. We just kind of did things out there. So my training as a young person was just just doing these things. It was natural, I guess, you know, for me. Yeah, very cool. So I know when I was a kid in the military family growing up, we moved around a lot. Um, I know that my dad went to places where we weren't allowed to go. How many places can you recall right off the top of your head that you have been uh, in your service to the military? So uh, five different countries. And I, uh, so Afghanistan, Germany, Canada, Philippines, South Korea, El Salvador. Those are the ones that I've been in. So there's been many countries that I've, uh, I've, I've, I've lived around the world. Most of those countries I actually lived in. I mean, I didn't go to the Marriott and do a vacation of two weeks. It was living there and living in the villages and things of that nature and getting to know uh, a population, the food, the culture and things of that nature. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Do you have a favorite spot that you were at? Oh yeah. It's just pretty much it's South Korea for the most part, yeah. just because most people don't like South Korea, but the food, I just, God, I eat kimchi every day, fermented cabbage and uh, uh, cucumbers and things of that nature. That's just a, it's in my, you know, and if I don't have, I know where to find it. If I don't have it, then I'm eating a raw piece of garlic or some onions, but I've got a taste. Uh, they used to call me Adashi. Adashi means a Korean man because I really adapted well. Matter of fact, I did adapt very well to other nationalities and cultures. I fit in very well. I kind of feel more alone in America than I do when I'm overseas in other countries. It's just, just me. I don't know what it is, but no, South Korea would be my favorite tour. Yeah. Wow. That is cool. I don't think my dad ever got a chance to go to South Korea. Uh, he did get a chance to travel a lot. And I think he did want to go there at one point. He didn't want to get stationed there necessarily, but <laughs> I, I think he wanted to go. Um, we were actually stationed in Germany when I was born. Uh, I was born in the Landstuhl Hospital just outside of K-Town. Yeah, that's where I was at for two years. Uh, Landstuhl, I uh, forgot that there was a village out there. Um, br br yeah, but I was, yeah, that's where I was stationed at. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so you know the area where I was born. Yeah, uh, sure I was. Is. I was wow. so young when we left. I don't remember like really much of it, if anything at all. Mm, wow. But um, I, I do remember our neighbors used to make some incredible lasagna. That's about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Their food, 
there, I don't know what about America. America has a processed food, but I feel like my, I feel stronger. Uh, I don't know. There's something about the, 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 I don't know if it's homemade or it's natural or the gardens or the processing mechanism of a food in America compared to overseas. I, I, there's a, there's a difference and I can, I can feel it. I can, yeah, I can feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, there, it's like a brick in your gut. I feel it too. <laughs> I, no, I, I love, I love, see in Germany, what you're talking about, the, the breads, um, oh, the, yes. the pizzas, the things are just, you, you buy bread in Germany and you, you don't sit it out. If you sit it out and don't eat it for two days, that stuff starts getting, because it's so fresh. There's it's a fuzzy. lot of, yeah, it gets all, all kinds of molds and things, but see in America, they'll put all this stuff in there where you can, to keep bread out at room temperature for a week because they've got stuff in there to prevent all that. But I, the fresh stuff, uh, the bakeries, the foods, the beers, everything. Uh, I just enjoyed it very much. Yeah. yeah. I went back to Germany for the first time since I was two and a half back in 2003, I was 23 years old. And I remember walking up to a little station where you can purchase sandwiches. And I bought a tomato mozzarella sandwich on this nice, beautiful, fresh bread. Oh my it's gosh. It's wonderful. Yep. I know oh. what you're talking about. Been there, done that. Oh, that's, it's that's great. so good. That's yeah, really good. <laughs> yeah. So I can, I can taste a difference. I can feel a difference when I'm overseas and uh, I yeah. Don't, yeah, it's just the way it goes. Yeah. How many years were you in the military? So I had 31 years in the military. Everything was from the bottom. I was enlisted. I started out at age 17 because, you know, uh, and then I went all the way up to Lieutenant Colonel, which was a, be a senior manager. And nine of those years were living overseas and many, many deployments. And uh, so, yeah, I've had a whole lot of time, my whole, my whole career, my whole military career and my family members. They also moved around. A lot of folks don't remember, don't think the family members take a hit, but they, they take a hit. They take, they take punishment just like the soldier does uh, because they have to wonder where the hell he's doing and where he's at and, if he's coming back and yeah. all that. So, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's not just the veterans. It's also the family members to the veterans. Mm -hmm. Yep. It can absolutely take a toll on a family. It's, it's tough, especially when you have children, your wife is left behind to be a single parent basically until you return. We went through that for uh, a little while when I was a kid my dad had a couple of remote tours. We couldn't mm -hmm. go with them. And my mother felt completely abandoned and alone. It had nothing to do with what my father did. You know, it had everything to do with this was his job. This was yeah. his career. That's what he does. There's a high divorce rate, um, yeah. uh, really high, more than the civilian world. Uh, if you're in there's some cert, certain specialties where, when I was in the special operations where I got electrocuted naked, they had pretty much 80 to 90% divorce rates. Um, so, yeah. Goodness gracious. Wow. Well, you're pretty blessed to have the amazing daughter that you've got now. She's uh, super smart and ambitious and I, I haven't met her, but I love her already. And I know she's big on wanting to uh, kind of promote your book and talk about it because she really appreciated that you were able to write it. We only have a few minutes left, but I want you to talk a little bit on your book, uh, where people can find it, where people can find you. And if other podcasters want to interview you, how do they find you? Jasonpipe.org. J A S O N pipe.org. I'm on Amazon. Yes. Thank you, Amanda. You've already connected me to some other people that I'm working with, but yeah, jasonpipe.org, a soldier against all odds. It's on there. So my website connects to all the social media and you'll see me out there. And uh, definitely, uh, yeah, if you want to hook me up on anything, I'm willing to talk to anybody regardless, but um, that's where it's at. Amazon. So Amazon is Soldier Against All Odds. It's a national bestseller. It's on Kindle. It's on audiobook. It's on other formats. I am the author. I am the narrator. It's coming from the horse's mouth. I am very authentic. I tell you what the, I tell you the damn truth about what the hell I did and what, how I got out of it. So that's where I think my book sets things up differently than most books. I'm not going to tell you I've done all kind of crazy. I mean, like I conquered Afghanistan. I'm going to tell you what I did. It's the ups and downs of a life in uniform. And so I think it's a little different. I'm a high ranking guy and I'm going to tell you where I screwed up. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I love your story. Um, I, I, I love just getting a chance to hang out with you once in a while and just chat with you. So if you don't mind, I'm probably going to reach out to you and ask you to come back on my show again in the future. 
Oh, please do. I've got other stories. Uh, if you just look at the chapters, you can see. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. Um, well, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes, again. absolutely. I love your story. I love your book, Jason Pike. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you. I love you and uh, happy Memorial Day. Well, not so much happy Memorial Day. Have a peaceful Memorial Day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm trying to find the stop recording button. Um, where is it? There it is. Got it. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. There you'll find links on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted. I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to my other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash growth from darkness.